So I, I thought I would talk, start by uh, kind of contrasting uh, the moments that I saw when I arrived in Greece uh, to the situation that I became a uh, communist in, actually. So I arrived in Greece basically at the heat or the, the pinnacle of things that were breaking out in the period of uh, summer of 2011. And I went and took a subway. I was told to go to a, the square, which is in front of the parliament. Uh, so I get in the subway, and I take it, and the doors of the subway open up, and then the subway fills with tear gas. And uh, hundreds of people start trying to rush into the subway, and they're trying to escape because their occupation uh, of Sintagma Square has been attacked by the cops with tear gas. They've been forced down into the subway station, and then the cops started firing tear gas canisters into the subway station. Uh, so, so people are trapped, trying to escape, and then I sort of like stumble out, and then I, I get taken care of by these sort of rebel doctors who are treating the people there. And, uh, and it, it's just a profound experience that's just so different from the world that I came out of, uh, of a period like 2000, 2008, where generally the left itself finds itself loosely aligned around the Democratic Party where left resistance and people are told, no, we're, we're going to demobilize the anti-war movement because we're not going to embarrass our Democratic Party leaders. Or the, the situation of uh, a, a demobilized or a, an almost non-existent anti-war movement. Uh, and the main resistance that people find or that they look to is various sects in America where they look to uh, NGOs, the Democratic Party, or trade unions that haven't produced any sort of resistance movement in many, many years. And so it, it's so, sort of a, you have a situation where people are told these are what the options are, this particular array of forces. Uh, and, and so I like to think of this as sort of a pre-conjunctural moment where the options are profoundly limited. And then all of a sudden, you have the Arab Spring, and for the first time in you know, decades, all of a sudden, there are major upsurges and rebellions happening in all these different countries around the world. And so you have Tunisia and Egypt, and then you have Europe. And, and so and then Greece is a particular society where the global financial crisis meets with the Arab Spring in this convergence point. And then you have like a situation where this even gets pushed into, the, into America itself and into the empire where we're told that a revolution is impossible to the form of Occupy, and now the things that will come after it. Uh, and so I, I think that in, in, in anything that we're trying to look at, whether it's Occupy or uh, Revolution in Greece, we have to approach it from its universals, or, or the, the underlying things that make it up, as opposed to its particulars. So, so a lot of people, uh, I'll give you an example, a lot of people I know of refuse to take part in Occupy at the beginning of it. Uh, because they, they would say things like, oh, well, I know, you know something that those guys tried to organize two years ago, and it's like some, you know, some group of activists. And they missed that this is a, actually an extension, or it had the potential to be the extension of the Arab Spring. And that there's this whole upsurge that's now happening. So even if the particular <coughs> activists who end up organizing this or that event are not very good activists, they have, suddenly have the, they have the wind to their back. And there's a, a, an upsurge that all of this fits into. And it's also a, if you look at the, like a, a pre-conjuncture, this is a conjuncture. So all of a sudden, it changes not just what people think is possible, uh, but also what actually objectively is possible. There's a rupture with the politics before it. Now all of a sudden, high school students feel like they can have a, a major walkout where they get suspended for 10 days. Or, uh, suddenly, the immigration movement is emboldened and wants to do things that it previously wouldn't do. There's a, there's a way that a conjuncture goes beyond just the individual subjects who are involved in the conjuncture. And suddenly they believe or in a, and are a part of a rippling that takes throughout the society, like a, like a tear. And then suddenly all kinds of things can go through it. So uh, Greece has a very, very similar history and array of forces uh, that the United States has. Uh, so so in, in America, the 
people know of the 1960s, there were many, many different resistance movements. And then over a period of time, most of those either ebbed, became sects, or they were absorbed and sort of eaten by democratic party and NGO apparatuses, especially during the 1980s. Uh, and I'm talking about America here. But if you go to Greece, almost the exact same thing happened. Uh, in the 60s, they, they had a, a major regroupment of revolutionaries. Uh, they, they had a particular party, which was a, a revolutionary party at the time. Uh, it was called the Communist Party of Greece, Marxist-Leninist. But in uh, that party suddenly just split and dissolved itself. Uh, it, and its people either went into the PASAK, which was a, it's like a new democratic party, uh, like the Democratic Party in the United States, uh, or they dropped out of politics, or a handful of people who used to be a part of the party decided to reform the program of that party and pretend to be that party um, for a period of time. So out of that situation, many, many revolutionaries were confronted with very difficult situations. And I'd like to kind of try to make a polemical argument about what revolutionaries in America should do through the experience of the Greek uh, revolutionaries and communists. Uh, the answers to their questions were not found in just simply a repeating of things that had come before them. Or, or for example, there's also, uh, I, I spent a lot of time around the anarchist scene in Greece. And a lot of the anarchist scene actually has split, and people don't realize this. But the majority of the anarchist movement did not re support uh, the squares movement in Sindagma Square. And then a hand, like a smaller section of the more creative and strategic communists, I mean anarchists, uh, ended up breaking from basically what were subcultures and subcultural scenes and going into the square and developing a revolutionary strategy together with a lot of other forces. And the same thing is also true of the communist movement. Uh, there was a need in, in a particular group that, I'm, that I spent a lot of time with and that I've researched uh, is, uh, is called the KOE, or in Greece they're called the KOI. And this group actually started as 17 people who came out of a previous formation and who, who believed that the answers to, the to a revolution in Greece could not be solved by a simple uh, repeating of previous verdicts or uh, s previous lines of demarcation. And, and also the reality that there wasn't yet uh, an organization in Greece that could lead a revolution. So uh, they formed a study group for several decades. Uh, they tried to critique and understand what was wrong and what went wrong in revolutions of the 20th century. Uh, what were the problems of a revolution in Greece? Uh, they, they developed you know, theories that there was a, a fundamental lack of strategy in Greek society. And uh, they developed new philosophy. They studied things out in the world. And then, so they had a sort of an opening up process of what was basically, I mean, the 60s communist movement was not a very, you know, it came out of a very open process and then it tried to impose a set of orthodoxies and verdicts on it in a way that sort of turned it inward. Uh, so, uh, out of this period, they ended up with a view of, uh, basically, new, em they call it new emerging revolutionary subjects in the society. So, uh, a belief that a conjuncture or a rupture in the society would cause different wellsprings of resistance to happen in different places. And, and so unlike most of the Greek left, which refused to participate in the squares movement, just like the anarchist movement did, I, actually, and, I, and I'll tell a, a little anecdote, I was in the squares movement, like in the center of the occupation, looking out at what was going on around it and watching protests of old leftist sects protesting against the squares movement because they were irrelevant to it. it it's, it's truly bizarre, but also the way the left acted in this country was not that dissimilar. Um, so as opposed to that, there was a view that people needed to go deeply in with the resistance movements of the people and that there would uh, be different wellsprings. So, so suddenly you have something... You know, people attack the squares movement of those are middle class white kids, which is, is not actually true, but they were a different section of society than perhaps the section of society that's going to end up being the backbone of a revolution. 
uh, and, and that's worth talking about if people want to talk about it in the question and answer. But I, I just want to say that you have something like Occupy happens, and then all of a sudden in a different place uh, with a different section of society, young black proletarian high school students walk out of a high school with very militant and conscious slogans and have their own movement. And, and so the solution to, so a, for a lot of people in the United States, they tried to deal with problems of like the composition of the Occupy movement through the passing of resolutions. Like if, if people would say the right words, like decolonize, like if people would say the right words, then suddenly the movement would change. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't happen like that. Uh, it happens with different wellsprings. Uh, and, and so in Greece, they had a view of like that this was going to happen here, and this was going to happen here, and this was going to happen here. Uh, and, uh, the KOE played a role of uh, developing, they call it leading through line, or, or uh, trying to, to launch creative initiatives that capture problems of the movement and that can reshape it in particular ways. So they had a movement called I Don't Pay, uh, which is, there's a, a <coughs> extreme austerity in Greece to where, for example, people's electric bills are between $500 and $1,000 a month. No one can afford electricity. There are, you know, 25% of people that are between 18 and 25 are unemployed. So people can't afford to eat, and then they have no electricity. So they would organize electricians to go through and turn everyone's power back on. Uh, or they would, uh, the, pull, the tolls get jacked up extreme amounts to where people can't afford even to go to work. So then people just organize to lift up the toll booths so that everybody can go for free. Or they ram the toll booths with their cars. Or they, they just stop paying for the subway in mass. And it's, you know, there's signs of don't pay for the subway. So everyone jumps over the turnstile or walks through the turnstile or, or sometimes they smash it. Um, or, or for example, there's a problem of uh, extreme racism, both inside the, in, in Greek society, but also within the squares movement. There was real racism. Uh, these were new people who had no previous politics, and the truth is Greece is a very racist society. Um, and at the same time, there's a different, a different wellspring of doctors who have all been forced out of their jobs. Like, I would need to get treatment, and suddenly the hospital I was going to would not be open that day, uh, or would be completely closed altogether. Uh, and, and so there's a way in which uh, immigrants are not getting treated, there's uh, racist hatred of immigrants, and then conscious doctors, uh, the KOE would, and, and other forces would start initiatives that would basically mobilize doctors to go and, uh, uh, to go and treat immigrants for free, to go and work in the squares and, and have the squares as a center to where people can come to get health care. Uh, so all, all of these, I mean, I, I'm giving these as examples of what communist, uh, a communist program and leadership act, should actually look like as opposed to the sects that people associate with the communist movement in the United States and in Greece, actually. Uh, and, and I think, I just want to also mention uh, basically four moments uh, of what, how the development of a revolutionary situation has emerged in Greece. So you have the period of 2008 where Greece is ruled by a party that's equivalent to the Republican Party. They're called New Democracy. But don't worry about it. It's not important. Uh, I don't like time constraints. Um, <laughs> uh, so that happens. Uh, well, that, that, that is the situation in 2008. And then suddenly, uh, in a a sort of subcultural neighborhood called Exarchia, which is the base of uh, the more punk scene of the anarchist movement. Uh, it's a section of the anarchist movement. Uh, Alexandros is murdered by the police in Exarchia. And Exarchia has this sort of history of, so it's like punks. So they like sort of had this one thing that's like ritual rioting, where it's like 15 people at 1 a.m. on Friday night, every night, like to fight police, so a cop will drive by and they'll start a thing, and it'll be like three cops throwing tear gas and like 15 people throw rocks. And it's sort of like a low intensity thing that happens. And then 2008 happens, and all of a sudden this kid gets murdered. Exarchia riots, the whole of Athens riots, and the whole of Greece riots. The whole country goes up in flames and burn the fucking thing to the ground. And, um, and it is not confined to that. And then among the existing left, 
all of the responsible uh, left parties come and say, oh, we don't support this violence, or, or KKE, uh, the, the old, uh, it's a parliamentary reformist party that was associated with the Soviet Union, uh, comes in and says, when the revolution comes, there, there won't be a single window broken. Um, so, uh, and, uh, uh, and then more radical forces uh, either participated in or defended uh, the writing. And, um, and it, was, it was a very important moment in which the new democracy party, the Republican Party of Greece, uh, is suddenly delegitimized. And in its place emerges the PASAK, which is like the Democrats. And then the PASAK get handed the global economic crisis. And so they end up unfolding the extreme austerity to people. And people can tell there are really no differences between these main, I mean, there are differences, but not substantial, between these mainstream bourgeois political parties. Uh, this is, you know, so 2010 happens, the society is being ripped apart. A new, a new regime gets formed above the Greek parliament to carry out austerity. Uh, it's formed by the International Monetary Fund and the EU. Uh, and then in 2011, suddenly the squares movement happens, which is a, what I would call a third moment, where all of a sudden there's a new uprising of people who never had any previous experience in politics, and it delegitimizes the PASAK. It unleashes squares throughout the entire country, you know, well beyond what people experienced here in the United States with Occupy. Uh, and it, it creates a sort, of, uh, a sort of vacuum in the society. Uh, and then since then, uh, now all of a sudden you have a situation where none of these mainstream parties are seen as legitimate to people. And then Greece is supposed to have elections in which the bourgeois political parties are unelectable. So all of a sudden the hard right and the fascists, they're, they're called the Golden Dawn. Actually, they're not... They're Nazis, not explicitly Nazis. Like, there's, there's a difference for them. Uh, they're the hardest right of Nazis. And they, they distance themselves from the, the soft Tea Party whites of them. Uh, but, uh, so, so they enter, and then all of a sudden the radical left enters the parliament as well and becomes the largest political trend in the country, which is a, a party called Syriza. And uh, Koi is a part of Syriza. Koi is the, the hard left of Syriza. Um, and then, and then a number of other, and then Syriza itself, through entering the parliament, splits. And you, you know, you have a group of people who want to go and defend the system, and then the larger Syriza becomes a more radicalized force. Uh, and so this is a part of what a situation looks like, where all these political forces and all the fabric of the society is being ripped apart. And elections, which are usually a co-opting time, are suddenly a, now all of a sudden the, the bourgeoisie and like the EU and all. Imper foreign imperialism, they don't want the elections anymore because it's being ripped apart and the elections are instead sort of the, a precursor discussion for a civil war where, where a discussion is happening where there are irreconcilable differences a, a government can't even be formed and the society itself is going up in the air I, I know <laughs> so uh, uh, and, and I'll, I'll just say that um, in closing uh, the Greek Squares movement was, a, was an opening, and then the most important things are what came after. So this was then consolidated into new organizations. People formed mass organizations. People formed revolutionary, anarchist, communist. Uh, they formed higher levels of cadre. Uh, and I, I, I would like to actually have a conversation about uh, a lot of people who have come out of Occupy, including myself. There's a large argument for, well, what's the next action that we're going to do? Uh, in, in sort of a lack of strategy, and so just like, what's the next big mobilization? And then there's a larger strategic <coughs> conversation that now needs to happen in the formation of organizations, and people have to figure this out. It's very similar to the early, like, SDS. You had a mass protest movement, and then it spun off 20, 30 different revolutionary organizations. Uh, so so we, have a, we have a real need for that, and I think that we have a lot to learn from the Greek revolutionary experience. Um, I'm going to talk and then we can have I should say, how many people are actually involved in Occupy? Like raising hands? For most people here? All right, so I want to say, like, I want to talk about like what happened in Occupy Atlanta, um, why we need an organization, and like, I want to ask you, like, what does that look like? 
um, because like I think there's a period of like we're trying to figure out what to do next, like Eric said. So I really want to like put that to you guys at the end, you know. Okay. So <clears throat> how many people were actually organizing before Occupy? What was the question? Well, how many people were actually organizing before Occupy? Okay. So most people were. Do you feel like Occupy brought a now a whole new layer of activist organizers that were? So if you were organizing before, um, you might have gone something like this. You go to a meeting, you go home, you have an action, you have a deadline, you go home, you have dinner with friends, right? It's like very sort of uh, routinized, right? Um, Occupy, for me, completely abolished that. And that was a really big deal. Um, you know, like Eric said, it was a huge rupture in the way we were before. And the interesting thing, because we, we, we was <coughs> occupations in the parks, that people had to like sleep there and live together. And, and, it, and so activism, organizing, was sort of the hobby, right? For like a lot of times hobby. Um, and to me, that's really exciting, because I was always like, I wanna, I wanna do this, I wanna be immersed in politics, I don't wanna go home and, after a rally, like, I want to take it to the next <coughs> level, you know? Um, so it was, our organizing, I feel like, even with, like, you know, I've had labor organizing experience, and there's, you know, organized unions and things like that. It was still, like, for me, very symbolic, you know? And symbolism is, I guess, okay when you're nothing else, but I'm sort of over it. Um, and there's, uh, when the park park created a space where people could just come to it. So it didn't actually need the other organizing that you might have done before, which is like trying to do outreach, right? The outreach like was already taken care of a lot. Um, so a lot of people that came into activism through Occupy never learned how to actually organize. Like, because the park was already, they came, people came. And I think that was like a huge weakness in that. Um, so through this experience, like I don't know how many people actually know about Occupy Atlanta, but it was actually really intense and a really big, like big deal. <laughs> um, we had a tremendous amount of uh, like competition with cops uh, and like brutality. Over a hundred arrests. Almost all the cases are still going. Um, I've been arrested from different occupation. Almost everyone I know has. You know, um, so there was like a layer that developed through this huge process. So of course it was like five to seven hundred people, you know, sub five hundred to seven hundred people before, dwindled down to, you know, a small cohort. So now we've had like we have like about nine months or something behind us and we've sort of forged these bonds with different people through this experience. Which is really like for me like very deep bonds that I have with people because I've fought the cops with them. Because like uh, uh, we've slept in the same you know same room areas, parks, whatever. We've been to jail together. Like it's it's a, it was a huge experience for me, and I'm sure that most of you would agree that. Um, but what what some a lot of the problems with Occupy was that <coughs> because of our experience, like I said, people didn't actually organize a lot of it, and like Eric said, a lot of the old left rejected it. They didn't come, or if they did, it was very superficial. They came for five minutes and then wrote 20 articles how much it sucked. I'm like, oh, <laughs> do you mind like, at least spend more than 20 minutes there? Like, um, so what, what happened was there was a disconnect. So the older, more experienced people who could have maybe offered strategy and other things were absent. So then we have young people <coughs> entering, and also older people who was the first time ever being engaged. And then there's like the professional activists that some were there. Like uh, for with us, it was the American Friends Service Committee, like the Quaker group. Organizing there um, emerged as the leader. You know, leaderless movement is of course false. There were definitely plenty of people who took on leadership positions. Um, so there was a disconnect where someone like me who's had a little bit more experience, um, but I'm not like you know I haven't had like ten years. I haven't you know had that many experiences that I could have like offered by myself. And the other, and older, again, older left weren't there, so they created this like vacuum where the discussions were framed around very like bad ideas, <laughs> like violence and nonviolence. Like that was like what like held us like for, for, for months, <laughs> and I'm just like, who cares? Like 
what is our goal here? What are we doing? So because like a lot of, um, and I use this like liberals that are very like hardened liberals, you know, big L liberals, not just people who have some liberal sort of ideas, dominate discussion. And the ones who opposed it were mostly anarchists that were young, who also like most of them didn't have jobs, whatever, so they could have, they had time to like troll in line or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but in this, at the same time, even though they fought valiantly, and I think they pushed a lot of like Democratic Party stuff out, and I, I thank all of them for that, they were still on the framework of the liberals with violence and nonviolence. And then their response became violence. And so it, it really just like killed a lot of like a larger contextualized sort of understanding of things. So, <clears throat> and because of that, um, so liberals clung to, especially it's like Atlanta, so Martin Luther King, right? This very, very shallow understanding of Martin Luther King. So they became like this like straw, you know, like, um, that they like clung to, which was like, you know, non-violence at all costs, everything's violent, I don't even know. <laughs> and then a lot of the younger anarchists were into riot porn, right? So they're like watching all those riots everywhere, and then this is like, yeah, this is awesome. So we have these two, two poles, and honestly, like, until recently, there was no third option. And often me, someone who, who like, was sympathetic to um, um, anarchists, and I always sided with them in, because I was outside of liberals, um, there was no another alternative, which was like a strategy. Uh, like, what are we doing with this? Like, we have this moment. Why are we not using it? You know, why are we like in these petty feuds? Why are we doing these like autonomous actions that add to nothing? Why does why does most of the uh, clique have become like? Uh, I mean, most of the like younger kids have become like cliques, and they like completely like don't even organize. You know, um, and then there was other forces like the bankrupt, defunct unions and um, that were tied to the mayor. You know, they got the mayor elected. Um, they got, um, they were tied to the Democratic Party. They, they attend their, you know, ballroom sessions and stuff. Um, so there was those people that were trying to sort of contain us, right? They wanted to contain it. They wanted to neutralize it. They wanted to make it nice. But when the mayor was the one that was, like, kicking us out, you know, in, in the middle of the night with, like, more cops than I've ever seen in my life, you know, very brutal. Where were the unions? They really weren't there. There was like one person from the Teamsters who was tied to the Democrats, who was there to continuously act like a conservatizing force. And so, where do people look to, right? Like, do we want to just burn things down here? Do we want to like contain and do some like bullshit CD actions that are harmless? and be tied to the mayor's office? Or are we somewhere in between where we have this sort of eclectic politics and we talk about nonviolence a lot and they just want to do actions? Like there's like constant actions planned, right? 20 actions a day, slapped together, no strategy. Does it add up to anything? Do we care if it adds up to anything? No. And so this is what it looked like for a long time. And I think it was, again, like symptomatic of the decay of the left. I mean, there was like four years of almost nothing, right? So when you see something like this, people didn't know. I didn't know what to do. Um, and I was also operating a lot of time by myself. <clears throat> and because I was by myself, um, and I was also trying to clarify my own ideas, because a lot of things weren't clarified for me um, during this process. I realized I also need my consciousness raised as well. So we always talk about other people and not the professional organizers or whatever. But no, like we also need to raise our own level of consciousness. And I was transformed by it. Um, so that's why I feel like for me, like the, the huge problem that I have to this thing that or uh, I when I lacked was like there was a false sense of realistness, which wasn't true. People who already were in positions of power or had resources, like an NGO behind them or something else, were able to very smoothly slide into the guiding roles. So this idea that, oh, that, no, there is power already when people enter these spaces, and to not acknowledge that is, is a disservice. So like, yes, I want, uh, you know, I'm a communist, I believe in, a, in, a, in a communism where we don't have leaders. Yes, absolutely. 
but we can't pretend when something's actually happening and there is a leader that we, we just ignore it. That, was, that again has been detrimental. So false leaderlessness um, ties to the mayor of unions and false frames of discussion and nonviolence violence debate. Lack of thoughtful organizing and, le and literal understanding of defending the park. So a lot of things became about defending the park instead of like, like literally defending the park. Instead of like, what can we be doing organizing that will get so many people out that we don't need to like come up with like stupid ways to defend the park because they'll we'll actually have mass you know, levels that we can do that. And like, what's really sad is that there was this moment and we're at this park called Woodruff Park, right? Which is, Woodruff is another name for like Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola owns the entire city. That could have been an amazing target, Coca-Cola. It wasn't, we didn't do anything about it. Instead, we named the, we renamed the park Troy Davis Park because Troy Davis was a very huge park. It was executed right before Occupy Atlanta. That's actually what galvanized Occupy Atlanta. Without Troy Davis, probably would have been very, like, much different. So we have, like, um, so we have these, like, concrete uh, things about Atlanta, like Coca-Cola, we could have thought about. We could have, like, acted on, but we didn't. And so, there's also, we could have gone to neighborhoods, like, you know, it's like organizing neighborhood councils or assemblies, what that could have looked like. Um, there was attempts at, like, Georgia State's, like, right there by the park, and there was, like, no connection between them. After by Atlanta, like, people students literally walked past it, and there was almost no connection. I, I don't understand, like, well, there was, like, moments that we really, really missed because we were so, like, what's going on, you know? And there's just like, no no organization, no like coordination, you know, uh, of m much more um, you know cadre, like more militant, more trained people who like understand, like you know, can look at other places and like learn from them. And that's what I mean by that, you know, militant. <clears throat> and so, how do we get? How do we build an organization that completely um, shuns nonprofits? is not tied to the Democratic Party, that's dynamic, um, that can learn from all the different experiences, uh, like summations of all these different things, like from Greece to like, Atlanta to Oakland to Quebec, and sort of put that together where we can have people um, like learn from each other and develop. So when the struggle will hit again, in the, in the, the, the rupture will happen, that, that's, that's like it always happens. Resistance is 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 something a staple. You know, like the sun come up, rising up. You know it's going to happen. So how do we prepare for that moment again? And what do we do during this period? And what does that look like? Because right now I got people are organizing. Like you know, this conference is one thing. Like this is an attempt to organize people from these experiences. <coughs> Conferences are good, but let's 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 be real. I've been to many conferences. You get really excited. You're like all all about I'm going to do this, and then you go home. Your mom calls something, you know, and then everything you forget everything. You sort of like go back into your own like routinized mm -hmm. stuff. So what I'm saying by organization is like many conferences, right? Like like mini conferences, like like constant coordination with each other, so we don't just have this one moment of conference two or three times a year, and then we just don't do anything. Or we do things, but it's a lot of it is very small minded, right? So it's like this project right here. How do we continuously? Um, how do we continuously think about? How do we build a revolution, right? If you are a revolution, if you're not, then probably my talk is not not helpful. Um, and and for us, like what we've been trying to do in Occupy, uh, like people from Occupy Atlanta is form this group called Take Back the Block. We started like defending um, foreclosed like foreclosed homes. But again, we entered that with no thought. <laughs> like looking at it, like I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, yeah, this is cool. Like, I don't even know if strategic, I don't know anything, I just did it, you know? And so we're trying to like actually learn about like well, where we're organizing and what we're organizing now and like trying to develop like actually like people who, who, want, who are newer, who need more experiences, like we try to give them the space and like do all that so we get more prepared and we can do that, that really hard work, that ground like one-to-one -one organizing. So when things do hit again, we can just mobilize very fast. And like something that was like I really love again the neighborhood like assemblies the councils like, I think that's a great idea. Um, what that would look like is tricky, right? Um, but a lot of times these general assemblies, which should have been much more 
popular sort of people coming together was very much directed by people from nonprofits because they believe in that process and they love meetings, right? Like, come, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a middle class syndrome. It's a meeting. Most people are just not are not used to meetings, especially seven hour ones. You know, and they don't understand process. And somebody always talks over somebody else, and then they have to get a lecture about how they don't understand that they're a man. They should be quiet more. I mean, it's like it's like these meetings are not they're 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 a learned process. You know, but people have to be invested into actually having them. So these gender assemblies that look like something that the community actually wants. And of course, we can talk about like what does the community look like and all that later. But um, so I want to say I want to end um, by saying that of course, no mass movement is ever distinguished uh, by one set of ideas. But if, if participants are generally radical-minded and asking questions and attempt to get to the root of society's dilemmas, they're transformed by these experiences. Um, and I think that if if most people really genuinely believe that we want to do this revolution, you know. Um, they will stay, like they will learn, and we will realize how to organize ourselves um, through this process. And and uh, I got a call recently where students were inspired by Quebec and everything in Chile, right? And they're like, we need a student movement, so we're trying to organize a huge national convert convergence of students in Ohio. And this is, hasn't gone public yet, but that's what they're working on. And so, it's just like so like awesome to hear that people are like, wow, like we're inspired. And now we want to actually organize and have this like four-day convergence where we are trying to really galvanize the students here in, in America. And they said in part of their statement, they said something like, we don't want to talk about why it hasn't happened. We want to talk about why it has to happen and how we're going to do it. And so I'd like to like end with that and say like we we want to win, we need to win, and I'm not interested in hearing why these things have not come to fruition yet as much as like, what are we gonna do to actually organize and and deepen the resistance so we, this like awesome feeling that we had for a few months doesn't end in a few months, but keeps it going, and is like peace. <laughs> um, so I wanna close that, like what does organization look like, and what do you think about all that? Uh, so, so I wanted to, I wanted to make two general points. Um, I, I, one was I, I really liked uh, the comment of the sister on the ground who I can't see. I wanted to make a point about the. Uh, I have an ecosystem view of revolutions. I think that different revolutions pr produce ranges of political forces, political organizations, uh, political trends. Uh, that can make a revolution, and that there's a need to see a value. Like, so, like, for example, um, with Occupy, there was actually a need. There was actually a need to defend the presence of certain liberal forces, even though those forces, in my opinion, should never be allowed to to run the thing. <laughs> but uh, but it was it was necessary that those forces were in the range, and then the there was you know, and then. Uh, you know, I, I think black blocks are sometimes a great tactic, and I think sometimes they're not a great tactic. And, and I think that there were people who were very attracted to that are definitely within the range, and that that should have been defended too. And then that should have been the response whenever people demanded that uh, anarchists who are involved in black blocks be expelled, and, uh, that sort of thing. And I, I think that there's an importance to seeing the range and seeing the value of uh, uh, different uh, trade union forces or, or whatever. Um, but also at the same time, there, there also will have to be breaks and ruptures and fissures that happen as a part of a revolution. So when I think of a revolution happening in the US, I imagine that a central question of that will be the ripping apart of the Democratic Party, like the facade happened in Greece. Like half of its people leave and join the radical left, and half of them become like really right wing. I mean, well, they're already right wing, right -wing fucks. But uh, but you get what I'm saying and, and, the, and the trade unions will be ripped apart and, the, and there's going to be some things that are going to come out of it really positive and some will be very ugly um, and, uh, and I think if you look at the history of various different revolutions uh, there, there is a there's been a tendency uh, in some societies where things end up consolidating around a single pole 
uh, that also that usually took place in societies that didn't have large civil society, or um, or where there was a very very small section of the forces that wanted a revolution. And I don't think that that's some sort of necessary verdict. I think there can be a revolution that has multiple revolutionary organizations in it. Um, and, and that may or may not happen. I hope it happens. Um, uh, but, but I think there's a value to seeing this range. I don't know, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and then I wanted to also to respond to the question about the Golden Dawn. Um, it's a question that a lot of people have. Um, two things. The Golden Dawn went from 0.3% to about 9% of the vote uh, in the recent elections. Uh, the Golden Dawn's base of support is the police. Uh, they are the hardest right of all fascist parties in Europe. They are the one that considers itself completely unreformed from Hitler. They kept the swastika. Like, I don't know if you saw their election victory speech, but it's like all these skinheads come into this room and there's like reporters who are sitting in chairs waiting for the talk to start, and they come in and start screaming at people, stand up, you will stand up and respect us. And then he comes in and he like bangs on the fucking table like Hitler, and he's got like the whole style, and, and then he, he even like uses like, you know, it's very weird. Uh, and, and it's also like, and then so people know like uh, Le Pen in uh, France won uh, 20%. Um, who's a, a softer fascist, but a real fascist. Um, so there, there is a phenomena. You know, the communist movement in the 1930s had a view that capitalism was moribund, and that it would gradually just die. And then, then at the end of that, the revolutionary forces would just slide into power. And the reality is that that is not true. Capitalism has a way of resolving its own contradictions, and every time it's come into crises, it's fixed them. And oftentimes it fixes them through fascism and other things that are very, very bad. Um, there may be an argument in Greece uh, at a certain point. If, if one, if Greece is forced out of the Eurozone um, and, and things are sort of left to the Greek bourgeoisie instead of the international imperialist bourgeoisie, where there's an argument that suddenly fascist forces start looking pretty good uh, against this large radical left that also doesn't have an armed wing in Greece, and, and the fascists do. Uh, and you know, like, they, they raid buses, and they, like, the Golden Dawn activists will stop a bus, and then they get in the bus, and they demand to see everyone's papers, and if you're a non-white race, and you don't have papers, they drag you out of the bus, and then the cops come, and then stand around them to protect them, and then they beat the shit out of them, uh, it's a, you know, a near lynching uh, to the immigrant. And, and so then they have a program of landmines on the border. Very, very ugly political forces. But, and then I also want to say something else. Uh, social democratic forces who, are, who have a reformist program oftentimes use the specter of, of hard right forces as a way to say, we should all just consolidate into one big thing that's under the leadership of my program, which is a very reformist thing that's much less radical than what other forces are trying to do. Fortunately, Syriza has actually been very radical. Uh, I'm, I'm actually shocked like how radical it's been. Um, but that said, I suspect that when a revolution happens, it probably won't be made by the whole of Syriza. Um, so I, I don't think... Uh, we also have to have a strategic nerve not to, uh, to liquidate forces in the fear of like some uh, specter of fascism. The Greek left has always demanded an exit from the Eurozone. They, they would say, we don't want to be a part of the Euro, we want to be independent. But now, all of a sudden, the whole Euro is under the threat of being overthrown itself. Uh, and so now they seek a unity with what they call the, uh, it's called the pigs countries. Which I don't think is a very good term, but it means Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. Uh, now all these countries have these massive austerity programs threatened to be pushed on them. And if, if Greece gets forced out of the Eurozone, then Portugal and Spain may go, Ireland may go, and the whole thing may end up unraveling. Uh, and so there's an orientation where this may actually be a precursor of changing the entire world. Oh. <clears throat> Just, I'm going to answer a few questions that I heard. Um, I think you were saying something about like we're sort of like a subculture, right? People don't even know about us. Um, and, and you're right, like we often are subculture, and I think that's 
I don't want to be a subculture, right? Mm -hmm. um, the right idea is to go out and like organize different parts instead of just like your friends. Um, and I think you mentioned can Occupy be reclaimed? Um, and I don't know. And nor do I really care that much. I think it's like I'm not trying to like you know as as friends said like I'm not warning or anything like I'm not like oh we have to resurrect this dead thing you know I'm like what are the lessons that it taught me so we can do this better um, you know I was definitely for riding the wave of Occupy whenever it was you know the word Occupy was hot and people you know liked it um, and you said like can you blame the leftists like we've been sort of shunned out by the centrists right um, no I don't blame I mean I think like when you have like a lot of sort of objective things working against you and you are, it's like you either are completely marginalized or you compromise, right? You have those two options. And it's very difficult because those times are when theory practice declines terribly because you don't have anything like, you know, like during these moments, like especially like anarchism is on the scene, so there's much more like discussions about what does that mean and much more like interesting things coming out of complexities and adding to those experiences of what an anarchist is because it's like a time where anarchists have been prominent. Just like when the communists are prominent at some point. You know, like so it's like these moments like are when people re rethink their ideas um, and become more, you know, find other people besides their, you know, very small marginal. And I again I am not blaming anyone, nor do I hate on older leftists or anything like that. I'm just, I think it's like an objective sort of reality that this is what happened. Um, I appreciate the question uh, you asked. It's like, what is like, and this is somebody who I've like worked for two different unions, you know, um, been around other nonprofits, never worked for a nonprofit, thankfully, but, you know, had like, have been there, you know. Um, and I've learned a lot of my organizing skills from that, and you're absolutely correct. The problem is, we don't have like mirror organizations that have that that skill set. Like we have a lot of really cool, awesome people that are not organized and they don't have the hard skills. And the ones who do, ha and the and the and there is like a prominent person, like say all of us, we never, you know, we just like started active, you know, being activists, and like a couple of us are like sort of like a little bit more skilled than others, guess what, they swoop in and take you away, and they put you in the nonprofit, they put you in the labor, and that's what happens, they steal all the good organizers, and it's easy, I mean, and think about it, I mean, you're like, well, you know, I need the money, and you, I mean, it's, it's hard when you, do, when there's not like a huge massive movement of resistance, you're gonna go with like any secure job, whatever. You know, I understand that. Like, I'm not, you know, judging people for all of these things, but I also know that we need to establish alternative organizations to the Democratic Party, to the unions, to all those. Like, and I don't care like what range it is or how many there are or any of that. Like, I'm not saying one big party, you know, like one big union like the Wobblies, but um, like I do think like. We need to be learning. Like I constantly steal a lot of the organizing I learned and try to put it in a more revolutionary way and teach it to people for free, you know? And I do that. But there is also like a level of people do have jobs or the commitment's not as much there when it's not your job. And those things are real issues that we like have to collectively work out. That's why I do think that if we take the idea of like we need to have a practice and we need to have like discipline to carry out all these things. So when there is no spontaneity, right? These, are, these infrastructures are already there. We'll be one of those infrastructures, so when things do hit, we're able to be like a prominent role. And I don't, I, I don't care if other trade unions, other pro people are part of it, but the thing is, like, it's been only these two voices for it right now, and that's the problem. That hasn't been actually hasn't been a multi-layered um, range, you know, like like uh, Eric said, like a range of of different things that spark. There hasn't been a huge range, and I think that's the problem. Um, because it also wasn't long enough as well to like develop more more of that. Um, so I don't, again, like I don't blame people for the nonprofits, unions, all of that. But I do think that these moments though undermine some of those infrastructure. And so who gets to make it to the sort of ne next round? This, this does depend on it because like some like unions were discredited in Occupy Atlanta because they like did the really fucked up shit. 
And so a lot of people who are neutral about unions were <coughs> like, man, they're like really shady. So there they was like a process <coughs> where people, like former infrastructures weren't like accepted anymore, like the mayor as well, Democrat, Democrats as well. So those things did happen, and I think that those are good things. That means that we have an opening for, for better things to come. And I would love to talk to you and others about how do we learn, how, how are we like the best organizers, but also have like the best politics, right? Because they're disconnected often. There's people who organize, they're taskmasters, there's people who have the politics, but they can't organize their closet. <laughs> so like, that's, that's, that's a divide between like mental and manual labor that's sort of a symptom of capitalism. We have to bring that back together. How does our practice, our discipline, match what's here to what we're doing? And that like, that's as for me an incredibly important part, you know? Like we need to, um, like when people look at you, honestly they don't always think about what you're saying or your ideas, they, who you are and how you embody <coughs> those ideas. Ideas don't exist without people. So you're embodying those ideas, so you better embody them well. People want to like look at you. I will like even knowing me, like I will follow, follow like a very like good person, like who's been there for me, who's charismatic, uh, who's shown that they're you know they're there to stick it out. Even though they have terrible politics, I'm more likely to follow those people than somebody who's better politics and has shown to be flaky to this and that. And that's the reality. Like that's how people work. So like you can't dismiss it. Like. People really, we need to um, embody our ideas. We need to get better at our ideas, and 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 that is like, and be more, um, I guess, cognizant of where people are at instead of just like wanting to where they should be at. You know, always meet people where they're at and then move, right? Um, and comment, <clears throat> and also the whole shy people comment. I think you said about like. Leadership, like, yeah, I, I'm not against leadership, like, at these points. I think what the problem is that leadership, when it's the same forces that are going to kill the movement, <laughs> that's the problem for me, for leadership. Um, and people do take, some people are much more charismatic, but they, they take it like a stand. But I actually, for me, like, I would think, like, <coughs> if we had an organization or more organized groups that people were, like developed enough, they could be interchangeable, right? So like, it's not like one person has all this like charisma, whatever, like we can't learn it or something. Like most people can learn a lot of things and they can do these things, you know? Like shy people, I was a shy person, like I'm not anymore. Like there's a process that I went through, you know? I don't think people are like, we can't teach them anything else, you know? Like people learn, I learn, I'm transformed by experiences. So I think that, yeah, I, I have no problem with leadership as long as it's the right leadership it's accountable, and it's not a lot of times what I see is leadership that no one talks about, but it's guiding everything. And that to me is like very like destructive because there's no accountability then. You can't call this person out because they're like, well, I'm not a leader. No one, you know? And that's like, I don't know, problem I've seen a lot with Occupy right now. So I'm gonna stop talking now. <laughs>